In this Math 2203 video, we're going to take a look at general linear transformations. To start off, we're going to talk about maps. We'll talk about functions that send elements from one set to another set. We'll talk about special maps that are called surjective, injective, and bijective. So what those words mean. You may have heard them as one-to-one -one and onto functions. After that, we'll define what a linear transformation is and see some examples. And then after that, I have some geometric examples in R2 for you. Let's start by defining what a map is. Essentially, a map is a rule that's going to associate elements from one set to another set. So if we have a set X and a set Y, the map is going to assign elements from X to elements of Y. So here's a really basic example where our set X has three elements and our set Y has four elements. So F as a function is going to map these elements A, B, C over to elements that are in Y. So for example, A could go to E, B could go to G, and C could go to D. Here's some terminology that you're probably already familiar with, but it's worthwhile clarifying. If we have a map that maps from a set X to a set Y, then the entire set X is called the domain. The entire set Y is called the codomain. And if we map every single element from X over to Y, and we think of that as a subset of Y, that subset is called the range of our map F. So if we return quickly back to our last example, I want to note here that the domain of this function f is x, so it's all of the elements inside of x, so the elements a, b, and c. The codomain consists of all of the elements in y, so those elements d, e, f, and g. And finally, the range of f is going to be only those elements in y that get mapped from elements in x, so d, e, and g. A map is called injective if distinct elements of the domain are mapped to distinct elements of the codomain. Another way to say injective is to say one-to-one. -one. So if we go back to that example that we had previously where X was A, B, C, and Y was D, E, F, and G, that mapping was one-to-one. -one. Distinct, the distinct elements A, B, and C get mapped to distinct elements D, E, and G. A map is called surjective if the range of our map is equal to the codomain. Surjective is also sometimes called onto. So here's an example of a function where our domain is A, B, C, our codomain is D, E. Notice that the range of F is equal to the codomain. A map is called bijective if it's both surjective and injective. Another way of saying bijective, you may have heard it as one-to-one -one and onto. So the classic example here is given, we've got three elements on either side. All of the elements D, E, F come from elements over on the left-hand side, A, B, and C. Also notice that the range of our map is equal to the codomain. So we're going to work a little bit more with surjective, injective, and bijective maps on the worksheet and in a couple of chapters. For right now I want to jump right into linear transformations and we'll define what a linear transformation is. If we have two vector spaces, I'm going to call them V and W, then a linear transformation, we would write it as T colon V arrow W. This linear transformation is a map that satisfies two properties. Uh, the first property is that T of V1 plus V2 is equal to T of V1 plus T of V2. So somehow we're allowed to break up this addition inside of the transformation. The second property is that T of C times V1 is equal to C of T V1. So somehow we're allowed to factor out the scalar multiplication by C. Of course our vectors V1 and V2 are inside the vector space V, and our scalar number C here was going to depend on our vector space. So C is either going to be a real number or a complex number. When we start working with linear transformations, it's going to feel almost kind of like a subspace proof. Um, the idea is to show that T is linear, we have to show that both 1 and 2 hold. 
Alternatively, if you want to show t is not a linear transformation, then we have to show that either one or two breaks down somewhere, so that one of those equations fails. So let's consider v as a real vector space, and we're going to consider the map t that sends our vector space v to the zero space, such that every time we put a vector into this map, we end up with the zero vector. Let's check to see if this is a linear transformation. So let's start with property one. Property one says that t of u plus v is equal to t of u plus t of v. So let's take two vectors inside of our vector space. We're going to add them together, and then we'll send it through our mapping t. Well, because this is a vector inside of our vector space v, it's just going to get sent to the zero vector. What happens if we do t of v1 plus t of v2? Does it get sent to the same place? Well, here v1 is inside of our vector space v, so it's going to get sent to the zero vector. v2 is inside of the vector space v, so it's also going to get sent to the zero vector. And we know that if we add the zero vectors up, we will just end up with the zero vector. So because these two are equal, it satisfies property number one. Property two is going to be proved in a very similar way. We're going to take t of c v1. This is a vector inside of our vector space. It gets mapped to the zero vector. Then we check this one, c t of v1. Well, this here is going to get mapped to the zero vector. So we're going to get c times zero, and we know that's equal to just the zero vector. So again, these two here are equal, so it satisfies condition one and condition two. So this particular map, where we send every single element of a vector space to the zero vector, is a linear transformation. So let's work on a couple examples where you can see how to prove that a map is a linear transformation or how you can show that a map is not a linear transformation. So we have two examples here. One goes from the set of two by two matrices with real entries to the set of all real numbers. And the map that we're going to look at is T of one of these two by two matrices is equal to the determinant of that two by two matrix. In the second example we work on, we're going to be looking at the space of um, infinitely differentiable continuous functions. And we're going to check to see if the derivative operator is a linear transformation. So to start off example A, I'm just going to let A and B be matrices inside of M2 to R. So because this is a nice small matrix space, we can actually write out these two by two matrices A and B. We can add them together to get the matrix A plus B. And what we're interested in is we're interested in that first property. So we're going to check to see if we can break apart this addition linearly. So what is T of A plus B? Well, by the definition of our map, this is going to be determinant of A plus B. Because A plus B is a two by two matrix, it'll be fairly easy for us to jot down what this determinant is. So here's our one, one entry, and we need our two, two entry. And we're gonna subtract off A, one, two. And you can expand out this expression to get the following. Next, what we're going to do is work on the other side of the equation. We're going to evaluate t of a and t of b and see what we get. So by definition, this should be equal to determinant of a plus determinant of b. So this is a nice two by two matrix. We know that its determinant will look like this. And again, b is a nice two by two matrix. So it's going to have a determinant that looks like Notice that the expression we have right here is not equal to the expression that we evaluated before. So what happens is our map T fails the first property. 
so we would say that T is not a linear transformation. For part B, we're going to take two functions inside of our vector space, C infinity, on the interval minus infinity to infinity. So what we're going to do first is check property number one. So we're going to take T of So we're going to take t of f of x plus g of x and see what happens. Well, what does t do to this function that's inside here? t is going to take the derivative of that function. And we have to be careful here. t is actually going to take the derivative of the whole function that's inside there. But that's OK. We know how to simplify this using derivative properties. We can distribute the derivative through get f prime of x plus g prime of x. So there is our left hand side fully simplified. Then we'll go move on to the right hand side. So let's check t of f plus t of g. How does t act on this function? Well, it takes the derivative of this function. And the same thing happens here. It's going to take the derivative of g. So we've shown that t of f plus g is equal to t of f plus t of g. So it does satisfy property number one. Next, let's check property number two. So for property number two, we're going to check that t of c of f is equal to c times t of f. Where in this case, I'm going to take c to be a real number. So how does t act on this particular function inside? Well, t is going to take the derivative of this expression. And we know that the derivative where we have a constant out front is really just c times the derivative of f of x. And of course, if we evaluate the other side, here t is only going to act on our function f. So this, again, is going to give us c times f prime of x. So we've shown that these, so we've shown that t of c of f is equal to c times t of f. Because both property one and property two hold, we could say that t is a linear transformation. 